All right. Hello and uh, welcome to what is already our seventh uh, YouTube live talk of the uh, Atlas Collaboration. Um, my name is Sasha Milhase. I'm uh, working at the Atlas Collaboration. And uh, yeah, today uh, we'll have another talk in this sort of slowly growing, steadily growing series. Uh, we'll start with uh, the talk and I'll introduce the speaker in a second. And then afterwards, as usual, you'll have the chance, um, we'll have sort of a live Q&A. You can use uh, the chat throughout the talk to post questions already. You can do that in the end. We've already collected some questions on uh, social media, like on our Instagram channel. And uh, we'll ask them at the end, after the talk for about half an hour, maybe a Q&A session. Um, all right, but let me get to uh, today's speaker and today's topic. Uh, today, we have the great pleasure of having uh, Maria moreno Lather uh, to talk about uh, top quark physics. Maria uh, is a senior researcher at the Institute for Corpuscular Physics in Valencia, Spain. And uh, she's working on uh, various things in, in terms of uh, physics in the Atlas collaboration. One, obviously, being uh, the top quark, what she will talk about today. But she's also working on uh, Higgs boson physics and in other things. And she's also contributed to uh, the data taking at the control room, commissioning of the detector, and upgrades and developments. But as said, today, she's uh, solely going to focus on uh, top quark physics. And with this, I uh, also have a warm welcome to uh, Maria and hand over to you for your talk. Thanks, Sasa, for the introduction. Okay. Okay, so welcome everybody. My name is Maria from IFIC in Valencia, and today I will be discussing and showing you how we work inside a top part factory. So the talk is divided into four parts. Uh, I will start describing uh, the standard model, which is the current best theory we have to explain uh, particle physics. Then I will uh, describe the Large Hadron Collider, the best tool that we have in order to test such theory. The top quark plays a very special role, and that's why I'm giving this talk. You will see why. And we will finish uh, discussing which are the missing pieces of the puzzle and uh, the future of top quark research. So the standard model of particle physics, as I just said, is the best theory that we have to describe fundamental matter and its interaction. So fundamental particles are elementary particles, those that have no internal structure that we cannot divide anymore. So inside the atom, atoms, we have electrons. And in, in, inside, we also have the nucleons. In the nucleus, we have protons and uh, neutrons that have quarks. So the quarks and the electrons are elementary particles. Those, we cannot break them anymore. Uh, so let's first study the properties of these fundamental particles, the matter constituents, which are, by the way, fermions. So we have, as just said, quarks and leptons. All of them, they have mass. They have different masses, all of them, including the neutrinos, even if the, ma the mass is small, they all have. The next property is the electric charge. It can be integral or fractionary. The, the electron and the neutrino have integral min charge, minus one and zero. And the quarks have fractionary charge. In addition, the quarks have color. And we call it like that for, due to the analogy of the behavior uh, of this with optics. So the quarks are confined they make groups, they have, they carry color, but they are combined, well, they indeed, they are confined inside the protons. We have a group of three quarks in, inside the protons, making a white particle, a colorless particle. We call that group of particles hadrons, 
And indeed, that's why we call Large Hadron Collider to the LHC, because the protons are hadrons, are groups of quarks. And we collect that to this property because of the analogy with uh, optics, I just said. And they also have a spin. So it's like an intrinsic angular momentum, and it can be up or down. But this is just what we call the first family of the fermion. So really the first column in this sketch. And that's indeed what we have in the ordinary matter, the matter that we know. But there are two more, two more families. These don't exist in matter, but we can produce them. And that's indeed what we do in the accelerators. We accelerate these particles from the first family, from the matter that we have at high energies in order to produce these additional families from the second and the third generation. And these particles are like the ones from the first family, but they are heavier. And in a relatively short time after we create them in the laboratory, they disintegrate into particles from the first generation. And that's why they don't exist in matter. Uh, so in total, we are talking about 48 states, but that's not all. We have, for every of these states, we have the antimatter particle. Antimatter particles are like the particles, but they have, they are identical, but they have opposite charge. So we have additional 48 states. So we are talking about four types or four values for the electric charge, two spin states, in the case of the quarks, three colors, and also three families. So why is nature so complex? How do we need so many ingredients? But that's not all. These particles also interact, and they do it via the force carriers. And those are particles that we call bosons. I'm sure there are a few of them, and I'm sure you all have heard about the Higgs boson, the one we discovered recently at the Large Hadron Collider. So the Higgs has a spin, the bosons have integer spins, unlike the fermions, which have spin one half. So the Higgs has a spin equals zero, and it has mass. Um, the carriers of the electroweak interaction can have, well, can have mass, and there we have three. They have a spin all, they have a spin one, we have three which have mass. They can have electric charge, the W bosons with negative or positive charge, and the Z boson, which is neutral. And the, phot the photon, which is neutral and does not have mass. And finally, we have the strong interaction. It's mediated by the gluons, which also have this property of color. And note that with all these, gravity is not accounted in the standard model. I will not discuss it today. So now let's briefly discuss each of these interactions. The electroweak interaction is the uh, unification of two more fundamental interactions in nature. Quantum electrodynamics and the weak interaction. Quantum electrodynamics is uh, the relativistic version of uh, quantum field theory of electrodynamics. And it's uh, the force that uh, explains or describes how matter interacts with light. It's mediated, I don't know if I can see the pointer. It's mediated by the photon and it acts over all particles which have electric charge. The weak interaction, I will start saying that it's a somehow weird interaction and we don't fully understand it. Um, so it's the one responsible for the disintegration of the, um, well, radiative decay of the atoms. It's only also the only force that allow us, well, allows to change from one flavor or one type of quarks to another. As for example, happens when we change from one type of quark that we call D to one that is called up inside the uh, nucleus of the atoms, the radiative decay. It's mediated uh, by um, massive bosons, the set boson for the neutral current, or they can have charge and we call them Ws. And it's the only force that acts over all the particles that I described before, the neutrinos, the lepton, 
the charged leptons, the electrons, and the quarks. In the case of the weak charged current, so when it's mediated by the W bosons, it only acts over left-handed particles and right antiparticles. That's what I was saying, it's a bit weird. And it's the only force that breaks one of the symmetries that we have in physics, charge parity. So charge is when we transform a particle into its antiparticle. And parity, when we change the spin, the direction of the spin of the particle. So the fact that this CP symmetry, symmetry is broken somehow is telling us that nature acts in a different way with matter than with antimatter. We don't fully understand yet why is that. But definitely there is a difference how this interaction acts between particles and antiparticles. So the strong interaction um, is due to the fact that quarks color carry this color. Uh, it's mediated uh, and is responsible between interactions among the quarks, is mediated by the gluons, and also the gluons carry color, as I also already anticipated. So the fact that the gluons interact among themselves makes also makes this strong extremely uh, sorry this strong interaction extremely complex so as i was saying before the quarks are form groups we cannot find them individually they cannot isolate they form groups what we call hadrons uh, and they are confined um it's based on experiments, we have also learned that, uh, and here indeed, by the way, you could see a sketch of the uh, proton. Based on the experiments, we have also seen that when the quarks get very close to each other, uh, the strength of this strong interaction decreases. And so how we can more or less, we can see them rather freely. That's what we call asymptotic freedom. So the fact that the gluons interact among themselves and that the strength of this strong interaction does depend on the energy scale of the process makes uh, this uh, strong interaction complex and calculations in quantum chromodynamics quite uh, very difficult. Indeed, they are very tedious. This is an additional challenge, uh, all these calculations but they are crucial in order to understand and take the best potential, the best uh, from the large atom collider, since there we are colliding protons, which are atoms. So all these calculations, although very sophisticated and tedious, are very relevant. So as you have seen, all these forces are, each of them, very different. The next one is the Higgs interaction. So as I just explained, the standard model in the standard model, these elementary particles, the matter constituents, don't have mass. The way they acquire mass in the standard model is via the interaction with the Higgs field. I will not discuss this much in detail since the previous Atlas Live talk from July was indeed dedicated to Higgs physics. So uh, I invite you to see this uh, talk from Conta. What I want to remark here is that uh, via this Higgs mechanism, not only the fermions, so quarks and leptons, acquire mass, but also those massive bosons that mediate the weak interaction. Those W bosons and Z boson also get mass in this way. And OK, you all heard that we discovered the Higgs in 2012 at the LHC. So we confirm uh, this mechanism seems to be I move now to the second part, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, which is the best tool that we have at the moment to test this standard model theory. So the Large Hadron Collider is a proton-proton collider. It's a circular accelerator. It has a circumference of 27 kilometers and is 100 meters underground. We collide protons. We have two beams of protons in opposite directions, and we make them collide in four different points where we build 
what we call detectors, huge experiments. They are like huge cameras of photos which record the particles that we produce in those collisions at high energy. It is indeed the most powerful accelerator that we have had ever. We have reached energies of up to 13 tera electron volts. That's impressive. Compared to the previous collider there, we reached two tera electron volts. Here we have 13. And we call it that it's a top part factory because we have been producing about 15 um, pairs of top plus its antiparticle, the anti-top part per second. And when we produce just one single top, we have been producing that with a rate of five events per second. So we have billions of events with top quarks. That's why we call it factor. So one of those experiments, it's Atlas, is the one I'm working on. And uh, its name stands for Atoroidal Apparatus because we have one of the magnets that we have is Atoroid. So you can imagine that it is like a huge cylinder, what you can see here in the right side. It has a length of around 44 meters and its diameter is of 25 meters. It's huge. Indeed, here you can compare it with the size of humans. Its mass is of around 7,000 tons and we are talking about almost 100 readout channels. Here, you, in the right side, in the left side, you can see a transfer view, what will happen if we cut the detector in this way. And you see that we have different layers with different materials built in order to stop each of the particles that we produce in the accelerators. To stop them in order to record and measure the properties. Uh, its energy, its position. But not that, that not just that. Atlas is also an international scientific collaboration. We are more than 5,000 members, uh, almost 3,000 scientific authors from all around the world. And you may wonder how, why so many people. And I can tell you because it's a huge work to build a detector. It's, it's a huge detector, right? We have tons of readout channels and different materials. It's a lot of work to build it, to operate it, to record all the signals, then to prepare all the data, reconstruct it, calibrate it, in order to do the physics analysis. Then we use really sophisticated uh, data techniques, uh, statistical tools, machine learning, in order to distinguish our signals over huge backgrounds, huge noise, until we reach and we arrive to the publications, to our papers. With that, we understand a bit the theory, we improve, even improve the simulations, and we come up with new ideas that we can measure. So somehow this is like a feedback loop, a cycle. Up to now, indeed, we have published in Atlas more than 1,000 papers, and more than 100 of them are about top work physics. So why is top work so relevant? I will now discuss its role in the standard model and how it, it is relevant in order to test all the properties and all the characteristics of this theory that I was describing before. But it also has a great potential uh, to see and, and to discover uh, possible new physics. Before that, let me do a bit of history. So here you have a timeline of when the different particles of the standard model were predicted by the theory and when they were discovered in the experiments. So we focus on the top quark highlighted here. It was predicted in the 70s and we discover, 20, we discover it 22 years after. This was in 1995. Uh, in the previous collider, not the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, but the one called Tevatron, which was in Fermi Laboratory in Chicago, in the States. And you can see that at that time, in these two historians, we were talking about less than 20 events in each of the experiments. And now, we have been, we are talking about millions of top quarks. So we have really reached the precision. So why is the top quark so relevant? In this sketch on the top, 
right side, you can see the different particles and the mass that they have. You can see that the top one, the top quark, is the one that is the heavier particle. If you focus now on the on these all these spheres, the volume of each of them is proportional. Of course, this is not uh, the real scale, but okay. The volume of the spheres is proportional to the mass. So not only the top quark is the heavier of all these fermions. It's, if you compare with the mass of the bosons, the heavy bosons, and of the Higgs, you can see that the top quark is even heavier than the Higgs boson. And this is something that we just know from since few years, since we discovered the Higgs and we measure its mass. So how can it be that the Higgs boson, the mechanism that explains why particles get mass, can give mass to a top quark, which is heavier than the Higgs boson itself? So this is probably one of the most uh, special characteristics of the top quark, but not the only one. So let me summarize them here. The first one, the top quark is the most massive fundamental particle that we know to date. Its mass of around 172 giga electron volts is heavier than the Higgs mass. Not much, but it's heavier. Indeed, the top is equivalent to having to have like around 180 protons or an atom of gold. Um, Right after the top quark is from the third family of fermions. So it does not exist in nature, but we create it at the Large Hadron Collider. It has a very short lifetime. So quickly after we create it, it decays, it disintegrates into another particles before forming bound states. So before I was telling you that the quarks make groups, right? And we only see the groups. Well, that's the case for all the quarks except the top. In the case of the top, it's the only quark that we can see it individually. But we can measure its properties through the decay products because most of the time it decays into a W boson and a B quark. So we can reconstruct these particles and then reconstruct the initial top quark. The top quark is a quark, therefore it carries color it has electric charge. It's uh, fractionary, but it does have electric charge. It has a spin and it has a large mass. So it couples to all the bosons, the photons, the Ws, the Z, the Higgs, the gluon. It feels all the forces and it's coupling to the Higgs boson, it's very large. It's important, therefore, that we measure all its properties with high precision. And this will bring, bring us, uh, give us more information whether this theory of the standard model is true or there is something beyond. So as you can imagine, because of all this, um, the experimental program of top quark physics is very, very rich. So we try to measure all its intrinsic properties, its mass, its charts, its spin, also the different mechanisms to produce it. We have strong interaction, weak interaction with more particles, and study its decay. If it's really into a W and a B quark, as predicted by the standard model, or there are other decays. We need to test all this in order to make sure that, or to understand whether the observed top quark, the one we discovered in 1995 and we keep studying, is really the one predicted by the standard model in this three family, third family of the standard model. So I will briefly review some of these measurements. The first one, a very important one, the measurement of the mass of the top quark, the heaviest particle. So measuring quark masses is something very difficult and very subtle. Uh, and that's why we have two different ways in order to compare the results. So the first one is by reconstructing decay products of the top quark. The top quark decays into a B quark and a W, and W also decays to two other particles either two quarks or a lepton and the neutrino. So by reconstructing each of these particles, we can get the top mass. And that's what, what we have done in several channels, reaching a precision of per mil level, 0.3%. It's impressive precision. There is another way, which is by measuring cross-sections. 
by measuring the rates how we produce top quarks because those rates are depend on the mass of the top quark. So as you can see here in the green curves, this is what the theory predicts. The rates predicted are as a function of the mass. In the dots, you see our measurements and the place where they merge each other. Basically, we can come here and then measure the top quarks. So as I was saying, these different methods are giving comparable results within the uncertainties. We need to keep improving them, but so far they are giving consistent results. There are different ways to produce a top quark. The most frequent one is via strong interaction. So the gluons that are inside the protons, inside the protons, despite the three main quarks, there is also all these gluons that interact among themselves. So this, these sketches are what we call Feynman diagram, a schematic representation of what happens in the collision. So the gluons, the mediators of the strong interaction that are inside the protons, um, collide and propagate this interaction, creating two tops, and top quark and the anti-top quark. And the rates of this is, well, as I was saying, this is the most frequent mechanism. We have already more than 100 million pairs. We are talking about rates of 15 per second, 15 events of this type per second. The second mechanism is via electroweak interaction. And in this case, the mediator are these heavy W bosons. We produce just either one top or one anti-top, but not two. The rates are a bit lower. We are talking about five events per second, but we have already on tape more than 30 billion events. And then we have what we call associated production. Either one or two top quarks associated produce together with a boson, either a Higgs boson, a set boson, or a photon, or even a W. These processes uh, happen less frequently, the rates are less frequent. However, we have collected a significant amount of, of events. And the rates is few events every 200 nanoseconds, approximately. So we have measured the rates of this. Uh, here you can see what we measure as a function of the center of mass energy of these proton-proton collisions. We reach up to 13 TB. But we were also recording data at 5 TB, 7, and 8. You can compare our data points, our measurements, with the predictions from the standard model. And you can see that they agree pretty well. If we zoom on this region, on the 13 TB, because that is most of the data we recorded at that energy, here you see different measurements that we did. And you can see that the Experimental results, this black dot, blue dot, sorry, it's even more precise than the theoretical predictions. So at the moment, the main limitations is really we need to keep improving on these very sophisticated and very difficult, I know, QCD quantum chromodynamics uh, calculations. We have measured the rates also as a function of kinematic properties of the top quark. That's what you can see here in the left, the rates as a function of the momentum, the energy of the quarks, top quarks produced. And you can see that we have events where top quarks have up to 2,000 giga electron volts. That's very energetic top quarks. Unlike top quark per production, single top quarks are produced via this left-handed electroweak interaction. What I was telling you before that the weak interaction was a bit weird because it couples with left-handed particles, so left-handed single top quarks and right-handed anti-top quarks. And due to this, um, the line of the top quark, the spin, sorry, of the top quarks that we have produced are aligned in a given direction. And we can measure this via its decay products. So by studying events where we have single top or anti-top quarks, uh, we could measure uh, the degree with which 
this spin is aligned in a given direction. And we did that separately for top quarks and anti-top quarks. And as you can see here, for top quarks, there is a high degree of polarization. Most of the tops are aligned in a given direction. Uh, I won't enter in details in which one, but you can see that it's mainly in this region. Why anti-top quarks, they are against that direction. This is indeed the first measurement of the full polarization of this single top or anti-top quarks in order to prove and test this electroweak interaction with these great particles. Another property, in this case in top quark pair production, so be a strong interaction, is what we call charge asymmetry. And this has nothing to do with the matter-antimatter asymmetry. I will come back to that later. This is just due to the fact that there is a different behavior in the collisions between particles and antiparticles, but that's unexpected different behavior in the collisions. And at the LHC, because we collide protons, and due to the structure of the protons, the top quarks that we produce tend to be more energetic than the anti-top quarks. So when we produce the pair, the top quarks tend to be more, less, let's say, in the central region than the top quarks. So there is a spatial asymmetry, and we have been able to measure it. This is a very, very small effect. We are talking about a six per mil level effect, but it's important to measure it. And indeed, we have evidence of this small effect. We measure such a symmetry, still with an uncertainty of around 25%, but we're able to measure such a small effect. And we did it as a function also of the invariant mass of the TT bar system. So as a function of the energy of the process of these top quarks. And you can see that the prediction from the theory, which is what we have in green, is that this effect increases, is enhanced as we go with energy. We still have that uh, large uncertainties in our data. These are the black, uh, sorry. You see the large uncertainties in our data points. But we have been able to see this effect and new data uh, will allow us to improve these measurements. So I've been discussing about pairs of top quarks, also single top quarks. Uh, and here you see the rates for these processes, how they compare in the different colors. Uh, it's the different energies of the collisions that we had uh, at the LHC. And in gray, you can see the theory. But in the previous collider, Tevatron, we were also able to produce top quarks and also single top. However, we were not able to see these other processes where we produce the top quarks with additional particles. Uh, Higgs boson, set boson, the photon. So they are rare. Here you see that the cross sections are lower, are orders of magnitude lower indeed. The rates are less than one event every 100 seconds, but Thanks to all the data the LHC, we have been able to observe all this process for the first time recently. And the precision that we have in those rates is runs between 5% and 30%, depending on the process. Indeed, for example, in order to test how the top quark couples to the photon, we measure a process that we call top plus anti-top plus photon. We measure the rates not only inclusively, but also as a function of properties of this photon, the momentum of the photon. And we also did it when we have top quarks produced with the set boson. In this case, the precision are of, of around 10%. So due to the large mass of the Higgs, of the top quark, sorry, it has a large coupling to the Higgs boson. Indeed, that's what you can see here in the bottom left side, where we see the strength of the coupling of the particles, of each of the particles, to the Higgs boson. And you can see that the top quark, given that it's the heaviest particle, the one with largest mass, it has the largest coupling, and it's of around one. The best way to, to prove and measure this test, this top Higgs coupling, is by measuring the rates of top quarks produced in association with a Higgs boson. 
We also did it, and we did it for different channels, depending on how the Higgs boson decays. We have been able to measure the rates, and we compare that with what we predict by the standard model. If this ratio is around one, it means that it's exactly as predicted, and any deviation uh, means that it's different to, to this prediction. So as you can see, by combining all the channels, we get something that is slightly above one, but compatible within the uncertainties, which are of around 25%. We measure these rates at 13 TB, but also at 8 TB. You can see in both cases, there is a trend that cross sections are slightly higher the prediction, but within the, within the uncertainties. So, so far, the experimental results seem to confirm the standard model. We have also studied a very spectacular mechanism, and it's the one in which we produce four of these heavy particles, four quarks at once. So for that, we need a lot of energy. We need to produce four of these masses. So basically, we need around 700 giga electron volts. And it's also very complex, since we have also all the decay particles from the four top quarks. But we have evidence of this process. We haven't observed it yet, but we are very close. In this histogram, you can see the number of events distributed in a way that in the right side, you can see those events that are more similar to what one would expect from this type of events where we have four top quarks. And you can see that the best fit is giving us uh, a ratio for these uh, rates as, as a function or divided by the standard model prediction of a factor two. So we are measuring something, these rates of around factor two higher than the standard model prediction, uh, but with still large uncertainty. So within twice uncertainty, this is compatible with the standard model. These results are still limited by the amount of data. So we are looking forward for the future LAC runs in order to improve the precision on these measurements. But not just that, we are also searching for rare decays. I was telling you before that in most of the cases, the top quark decays to a W boson and a big quark. And any other decay that is different to this one will be what we call rare decays, which are almost zero according to the standard model. But we try to search for them. Maybe it could happen that the, sometimes the top quark decays into a Higgs and a quark or a set boson and quarks, or even directly to charged leptons. So we have tried to search for them. We haven't seen any significant effect, but we have set upper limits in these probabilities for these processes to happen. We have also searched for new physics, and we do that in two different ways. What we call model dependent, where we directly search for new particles that are not present in the standard model. It could be, for example, charged Higgses that are not in the standard model, or vector light quarks, different type of particles. So far, we haven't seen any. So we set upper limits on the mass that these particles could have, given that so far we haven't seen them. And we also do what we call model independent studies. Those are basically where we effective field theories in which we expand the standard model with additional terms that would modify each of the interactions. For example, the interaction of the top quark with the W boson, or with the set, or with the Higgs, with the gluon. We add additional terms where we modify, we allow for modifications uh, of each of these interactions in order to see whether for any of them we see any deviation. So all these coefficients should be equal to zero in the standard model. And we try to set bounds on these limits in order to find whether there are any deviations. So as you can see, this result is indeed from September of this year. And that's because exactly last week, we have the annual top car conference. We have many conferences, and that's one of the best uh, things that we have in this business of particle physics or conferences. We have many of them, but the one, there is one that happens every year and it's dedicated just to top car physics. So it's what we call the top conference and the 14th edition took place last year, uh, last week. Unfortunately, it could not be in person, but we met all virtually and we took this uh, nice photo. 
So there, indeed, we discuss um, the state of the art on top core physics, and that's what I want to summarize somehow here. So what do we know about top core? So we have been measuring uh, intrinsic properties, uh, all of them, its width, electric charge, the mass, reaching precision of up to uh, per mean level for the mass. We have measured the rates via different mechanisms, strong interaction, electroweak interaction in association, association with other bosons. Uh, in some cases, we have really reached amazing precisions in the case of uh, per production of 2% even better indeed at the theoretical calculations. And we have seen events where we have very, very energetic top quarks up to two TB. We have also studied the decays of the top quark, its polarization, and also search for rare decays setting up in limits. But that's not all, we need to go with John because we know, I will tell you why, there are missing pieces in the puzzle. It's also important to understand the interplay between the top quark mass and the Higgs mass. And I will also discuss uh, the future of top quark research. This is just the last part of the talk. So do we have all the pieces of the puzzle? The answer is no. There are some missing pieces. For instance, gravity is not accounted for in the standard model, but there are also some open questions and I will point you to two of them in a while. Do the existing pieces fit all together? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. So far, the experimental results seems to say point to yes, but definitely this theory has too many free parameters. And for sure, there are missing pieces. So there is something beyond the standard model that we know. All these that I was telling you before about the fermions, the boson, the standard model, only explains 5% explains of, of the energy matter density in the universe. So only 5% of this pie chart is ordinary matter. The rest, the 95%, we don't know what it is. We call it dark matter, dark energy, but we don't know what it is. So we just know the top of the iceberg. But not just that. The Big Bang should have created the same amount of matter and antimatter, which subsequently decay, but that's not the case. Nowadays, the universe should be, therefore, just the leftover energy. And that's not what we see. There is a tiny fraction, but a tiny fraction of matter managed to survive. And that's why we are here, matter and not antimatter. So this is really a tiny fraction, because mainly it's what we have is light, photons. We are talking about an asymmetry of matter and antimatter of around one per million, one over a million, but there is a matter and antimatter asymmetry that we don't understand. And talking about these problems of the universe, we could also discuss about the stability of the universe. So, according to the Higgs theory, in our present universe, we are in a minimum of the um, Higgs uh, vacuum. Uh, but any fluctuation could bring us uh, maybe to other minima of this um, potential. It could be that we are in an absolute minima and therefore everything is there, even if there is a small fluctuation or universe is stable. But it may happen that this minima is not absolute and there is another one, and that we live in a metastable universe. And why does it matter? It's just precisely if the top quark, the one that it's really depending on that. So the top quark mass that we measure, that is of around 171, 172 GB, it's really the one that will tell us whether we are really in an absolute minima in a stable universe or there is another minima. So we need to keep measuring the mass more precisely uh, in order to know whether we live in a stable or unstable universe. Don't panic. We know we don't live in an unstable universe. It can't be unstable since, okay, since the Big Bang, it has, well, we have been, the Big Bang took place 
more than 10,000 million of years ago, right? We are here. We are here, so our universe is not unstable. Don't panic. But who knows? We are really on the edge between stable and metastable. So we need to keep improving the measurements of the top mass, but also on the Higgs mass, and understand the interplay between these two particles. This is also model independent. So a bit careful with this. But the main message is, OK, the universe is not unstable. It could be unstable. Definitely, it will not disappear uh, tomorrow. But it's important to keep improving the measurements. So with that, somehow I come to my summary. Uh, the standard model is one of the greatest achievements of fundamental science. It has been experimentally confirmed over the last 50 years with incredible precision. It is very successful in giving account for most of the observed phenomena. And with the discovery of the Higgs boson uh, nine years ago, and with all the measurements that we have performed at the Large Hadron Collider, it is definitely more consolidated. However, despite all its success, there are several questions which remain open. Why three families of particles? Why do particle masses and coupling constants have the, the values that we measure? Why is there more matter than antimatter? Where dark matter fits in this model? And gravity, right? That hasn't been described by, by the standard model. So we are sure that there should be some extensions for this model. So far, we haven't found any signs of new physics, but the search continues. And definitely the top quark is a place to search for this, given that it's a very, very special particle. That's why indeed we obtain or we publish more than 100 top physics papers. First times that we measure these cross sections in the at in Atlas, uh, cross sections of per production via strong interaction, of single top quarks via electroweak interaction, when we measure the mass, when we measure its coupling to the Higgs boson or to other heavy particles like the Z boson, or even, for example, uh, studies of this four top quark reproduction. All these have been quite some milestones in top quark physics, but this is just the beginning because uh, the LHC started to record data in 2011. Today we are here. This is basically not even the middle of the LHC lifetime. Next year, we will start with what we call run free. At the moment, we are working on improvements of the detectors and also improvements in the Large Hadron Collider, so the accelerator itself. And next year, we will start with data taking again. We will go back to the control room. And we expect indeed to increase the amount of data by factor two with respect to what we have before. Afterwards, around 2025, so in four years from now, we will stop again to do some further improvements. And later on, we will record more data. So there, indeed, we will increase by a factor of 10. So we, up to now, we have already millions of top quarks. By the end of the LHC, we'll have billions of them. So definitely, it's a top quark factor. Of course, there are many challenges ahead. We need to understand all the systematic uncertainties, also the theoretical calculations that are very important. But there are also many, many, many opportunities because we'll have a vast sample of top quarks. And I hope many of you join us on this journey. Thanks a lot for your attention and thanks to many people. And thanks a lot to you as well, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Very nice. And uh, as promised, now we can dive into questions. So uh, as we just put in the chat as well, so uh, everyone, please feel free to uh, post questions in the YouTube chat. And then uh, we'll sort of do a mix of uh, Instagram and YouTube questions. And then uh, you'll get answers. Hopefully. Um, all right, then I think we can start with one that's that's actually quite interesting. Uh, you you talked about uh, top quarks at the LHC mainly, but there was a question: uh, where else uh, can one find top quarks other than at the LHC? 
Wow. Okay, so at the moment is the only accelerator where we can create them. Because as I was telling you, the top quarks are from the third family. So they don't exist in ordinary matter. We really need high energies in order to produce them. They could be if somewhere in the world there is really high, high energies and high densities where we have top quarks. We cannot create them. We didn't need energy to create them. They are not in nature. And at the moment, uh, the Large Hadron Collider is the only accelerator that we have in the world for that. So it's really a unique place to look for it and study it. It certainly is. But is there, I mean, just to follow up, is there any places in the universe where we, I mean, theoretically have these energies available? I guess that's sort of where the question was leading to. Well, I'm not sure I can reply to that. <laughs> I guess we don't really know. Uh, definitely, that's why we build, we create them in the labs in order to study them. But let me leave somewhere outside. There is, there are high energies, as at the beginning of the universe, right in the Big Bang. It could be, yes. <laughs> All right, then coming maybe back a little bit to the LHC again. Um, so you talked about sort of measurements of the top quark mass, for example. Uh, and there was one question in the chat uh, where the person wanted to know which parameter of the of the LHC essentially is sort of most important to improve the measurement. Is it the luminosity or is it the the energy, the center of mass energy? Okay, that's indeed a great question. So uh, I was telling you about uh, mm, that we measure the rates, also the masses, but I wanted to highlight that the per production, the rates of per production were measured with even more precision than the theoretical uncertainty. And there, the experimental uncertainty, it's really the main one, it's the amount of data that we have. So really the uncertainties of the luminosity are the ones that are limiting those measurements of the rates of how many quarks we produce. For the top quark mass itself, the main uncertainty is not yet luminosity. It's mainly modeling uncertainties. So how well we simulate top quarks, how well um, the theory indeed, all these calculations of quantum chromodynamics enter. They are complex and there are even some regimes that cannot be calculated and they are complex. Right. Then we have sort of something that goes a little bit beyond. It's, it's, it's a similar direction, um, but it's basically the question of how much can we improve the measurement at the LHC still, or do we need to go beyond? Uh, okay, again, very good question. So, so far indeed, we have reached a precision for the mass of 0.3%, so three per mil level, and that's impressive. Uh, indeed, Matt, I mean, it's much more precise than what we were anticipating at the beginning of the LHC. And there, the main limitations, as I was saying, are the theoretical uncertainty, so how well we are, we were, are able to simulate these processes. And uh, how the way we reconstruct the top quarks, right? I was telling you before, before that one of the ways is from indirect reconstruction, well, re kinematic reconstruction of the top quark decay products. And in the case of the quarks, what we see in the detectors are really jets of particles because the quarks don't exist as free, right? They combine into other particles, interact quickly. And basically what we have is a jet of particles in the detectors. And that has quite some instrumental uncertainties. All the reconstruction of these jets, of these quarks, how we calibrate them, uh, have large uncertainties. How well we are, well, we measure the energy or the momentum of these quarks in our detectors. Those are also quite un some uncertainties that we could improve. Unfortunately, uh, it's not trivial. Those are systematic uncertainties, but we are 
develop, we are working on that and developing uh, smart ideas uh, how to improve that. Uh, of course, yes, future accelerators um, that maybe um, are a bit cleaner in that way because maybe we don't collide protons but other particles and therefore maybe the backgrounds are different to what we have uh, in these type of collisions because are uh, different types of collisions. Um, might be cleaner, uh, but still I think this is really an impressive precision and difficult to, to improve. But there is some room for that, and I think we have some ideas to work on. All right, then we have another uh, a quick question. Why do top quarks decay so quickly? Oh, that's a golden question indeed. <laughs> um, yeah, that has to do with its mass indeed. Um, um, okay, I don't have the formula here, but basically the decay length of the particle, it's inverse to its mass. So the larger its mass, the shorter its lifetime. All right. And yeah, due to its large mass, it quickly disintegrates before really having time to combine with other quarks to form hadrons, to make loops of, of quarks. And that's really unique of the top quark because of its large mass. That's why, okay. We don't have free quarks it's for all except the top quark. All right. Uh, then we're moving a little bit away from that. But the question, uh, another question we got is, is it possible that the top quark has something to do with dark matter? We believe so. We are not sure, of course, but it's one of the, because of its unique properties, right, of the top quark, is one of the places where we believe that maybe it's easier to, to find or to search for the dark matter. And we are trying to, we are searching for that indeed. We have many, uh, I'm sure that will be dedicated, where there were and there will be dedicated um, live talks on these topics of dark matter. But yes, there are many searches. Uh, so far, we haven't seen any. So we have set limits of these dark matter candidates. But we believe so, and I believe so. But we need to keep working there. Many of those results indeed are limited by the amount of data because dark matter, we don't see it. So for us, it's somehow invisible in the detector. So we really need to select them in a special phase space. So we need, somehow we need to select events in which we have this missing information. We have a way to account for this missing because of momentum conservation and the fact that our detector is, is a cylinder and it's closed, okay? That's a bit complex, and I think there was a talk about um, recon well, data reconstruction and so on. Uh, but these missing particles, we have a way to somehow infer that they were there. Uh, and okay, at the moment we have still limited statistics because we need to select these events, and it's not trivial. We need to apply some requirements on them. Uh, so definitely, again, future. Large, the, the future data from the Large Hadron Collider will may guide us on that. And then we have a we have a um, another question that sort of connects to to what you said that it's uh, that it doesn't hadronize. Since the top quark is the only one that can be seen alone, is it and it's so heavy? Is there any doubt that the top quark is indeed a quark, or maybe something else? Uh, suggestions are a composite pi particle maybe or, or something else? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, honestly, it might be. So far, uh, we have measured its properties and they seem to be as predicted by the standard model. Uh, but what if it could be that maybe um, there is something more composite that still agrees with all these properties that we have been measured? because there might be theories uh, theories in which this is the case. They fulfill the properties that they have in the standard model plus additional ones. Um, I think that's indeed important and why we need to keep improving in these measurements and, and see whether um, it's really a quark or there is something more. 
And for that, it's very important to keep improving on understanding interactions via all these forces, the Higgs, electroweak, the photon, and the gluons. All right, then, sorry. <laughs> Okay, no, oh, there's, there's, there's another, there's another interesting one moving a little bit away from the top, maybe, but nevertheless, since you also talked about uh, uh, the, the general setup, does gravity or gravitational waves have any effect on particle collisions in the Atlas experiment? Wow. <laughs> uh, for gravitational waves, I would say, I guess not. Um, gravity, I mean, it's, it's negligible. Um, the fact uh, for these particles is almost negligible. So it's really, um, yeah, probably not, but I'm not sure I can play much more to that than that. So. All right, um, here's an interesting one. <laughs> What is the uh, success rate of theories beyond the standard model nowadays? Wow. <laughs> yeah, um, again, it's, it's a difficult question, honestly, because I think there are, it's true that we haven't seen any confirmation that, okay, this is something new, and therefore this hypothetical uh, new theory, it's the one that is true. Uh, so far, with, we have been able to do is to say, okay, this theory is not true because I have not seen that, that it was predicted or hypothetically predicted by, by that. Uh, so in that sense, I would say that, uh, yes, the success rate of these theories is, is low, uh, but we need them, right? Because it's also true that we need something beyond the standard model. Uh, so I think it's, it's important to have this communication between theories and experiments. Uh, we are now, thanks to the LHC, we are measuring a lot of things. So we are going back to them, giving them feedback. Okay, this theory, no, because I haven't seen this particle up to this energy, right? Because at the end of the day, is up to what we have now. With the energy that we have, with the data that we have, we can sometimes set limits. Because I haven't seen this with this, it means that it has to be heavier or it can happen as with this frequency because otherwise I would have seen that, we guess. But it's important that I think we keep communication uh, among all of us because what it's clear is that also the standard model cannot be uh, the last word. So we all need to keep working. And particularly now, right? That because we don't see any of them maybe more obvious alternatives, uh, theories for the standard model, we need to keep working closely. On this beyond standard model theory, but also on trying to improve the calculations. As I was saying, it's, it's really a limitation in order to take the best profit from the Large Hadron Collider, we need accurate calculations of quantum chromodynamics. So on this, I think it is also important uh, that we keep working and collaborating. All right, and then I think we'll get to the last question. Um, and that is, what is your personal favorite top quark results from the past years? Okay, that's somehow easy <laughs> because um, my thesis was on single top quark and this beginning of top quark polarization measurement. But the most uh, or the recent years, I've been working on the cup, understanding the coupling of the top quark to the Higgs boson. So probably this second is uh, one of my favorite topics. But indeed, the ones I covered today here are somehow what I feel uh, my work in the last years. But yeah, I think top understanding top of Higgs is, is crucial, particularly since you know 2012 when we saw that the Higgs boson has a mass that is less than the one from the top. That made, I think, the top quark even more special because an understanding top of Higgs is, is a must and I think it's really the way uh, we need to keep working well, among many other interesting things. But I think that's crucial and it, that's now the time uh, thanks to all the data from the large subnormal data. 
All right, then I think it's time again to thank you very much for the talk, uh, for being here with for the for the Q and A for the questioning session. Uh, thanks also to everyone uh, that uh, listened and that put questions in the chat. Uh, we hope that we could try at least try to address a, a good bunch of them. Um, yeah, so thank you very much again, Maria, for uh, for this nice talk and for being with us today here. Um, as I said at the beginning, this is the uh, seventh edition of our YouTube's live, so uh, there's more coming up. So stay tuned. Uh, follow us on YouTube and also on the other social media platforms. You can uh, have a look at the webpage atlas.cern. Um, to find out everything about the experiment and how to sort of follow us and be with us for the next one. So with that, I think we can close today's talk. Thanks again, Maria. Thanks everyone. See you next time. Thank you very much.